5, verse 6. Though he was God, he did not think of, of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Amen. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Um, this, as we were rehearsing this, this morning, I, I was thinking, um, there's a song that I listened to, a worship song, um, that has a lyric in it that's uh, to sleep beneath the stars that you had made. And uh, this, this next song is, is kind of talking about uh, the earth and the sky and the water and all that stuff um, that, we, that we see here on earth. But um, that lyric the other day when I listened to that song, that lyric jumped out at me thinking, how cool was that? That Jesus came down to earth. He was there to help or to create the stars and the earth and the, and the world. And then he came down to actually enjoy that stuff and see it. Like, can you imagine what that would be like? Like, can you imagine him looking at his disciples and being like, hey, dude, Peter, I created that. I helped create that. Like, that's, um, so that really has nothing to do with, with the song in general. I just thought of it this morning and uh, thought I'd share that. But it's, um, he lowered himself to to be on the earth, just like we are, um, although he did it perfectly and for a reason, not just to live on the earth, it was to die and, and save us, be the ransom from heaven, to, to free everyone around him and all of us uh, from, from hell. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, let's, uh, let's sing about how amazing God is.
All right, welcome everybody. It is good to see you this morning. I don't know why I'm yelling. It seems like my voice is really going so far. Um, I appreciate you being here. Thanks to all of you that are with us online. Uh, it's a little intimidating here this morning because, well, I guess it's not icy this morning, but I was a little afraid when I got up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody out on the roads last night? Yep. Yeah, I wasn't sure we'd be here this morning. So uh, I am thrilled to see you here this morning. And again, we, we like to welcome those that are joining us online. Uh, the roads weren't that bad, so you, you could you could have come out to see us in person. Uh, but we're glad that you are with us. Um, we're starting a new series this morning. I am excited about. I think that this, this message, um, you, you have a hint here from our video and uh, if you if you think to yourself well it's something about grace it has to do with grace and I already know all about that so uh, you know I'm just kind of tune out now and uh, and just try to just try to suffer through but uh, I want to encourage you this morning that we may not know uh, all about grace that we think we do and um, and I'm here to share with you and we over the next of course the next few weeks we're going to be talking about the grace of God. Where's uh, Where's Toy Petty this morning? Did I see Toy Petty this morning? Back. There's Toy Petty. Oh, how, how, when was the last time that you asked for, I think, uh, I thought to myself, hmm, I think my mom asked me to do a series on grace. Uh, that was maybe seven or eight years ago. Ha <laughs> ha! So that's about how fast I am, right, Mom? She, she doesn't even remember it. She doesn't even remember it. Like, what is he talking about? Um, but grace is an awesome thing, and I think that uh, this may... Uh, change your life or the way you, you look at things this morning. And uh, certainly the grace of God will change your life. I don't know if this message will, but the grace of God will change your life. So we're going to examine the scripture. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to, uh, to minister to us and reveal truth and, uh, and reveal to us more about what the grace of God really is. So this is applicable for um, those that have been believers for a long time, new believers, maybe those that are just exploring, trying to figure out what this gospel thing, what this church stuff, what Jesus is really all about, if it's really true. So it's a vast subject. And so we just want to uh, uh, touch on it a little bit this morning and in the upcoming weeks. So, uh, but I want to begin by saying that when we think of grace, we often think that that has to do with salvation or by grace we are saved through faith, right? So we think that, that grace is a salvation thing, and it's a forgiveness of sin thing, and indeed it is. But if, if that's what our understanding of, of grace is, then, uh, then there's much to learn. Grace is a much bigger subject than that. So I want to begin this morning um, with a story that you might not expect to hear from uh, in church. It might be difficult to hear. You know, I, I heard many, many years ago that uh, when you begin a message, you often want to endear the audience to yourself, right? Endear the audience to yourself. So maybe, uh, maybe you don't know me or maybe you don't know the crowd that you're speaking to, so do something to get them to like you. Usually, it's give them a laugh. Well, I'm just throwing that advice away this morning and I'm gonna tell you a tragic tale. Wrong, wrong idea, I guess, as, as some would say. But I wanna share with you a story that um, you might not expect to hear in church. Um, and again, it might be difficult to hear. It's a story of an abusive husband and his wife. The husband, given to often, oftentimes to fits of rage and anger, um, and horribly at times, um, that anger would sometimes manifest and overflow into violence, like the time he slammed his wife up against the kitchen cabinets, or the time that he slapped her across the face and then ran out of the home, found a place where he uh, trembled and cried. The wife, a Christian woman, forgave her husband. How many times do you think she forgave her husband? Each time that he came home, he said quite accurately, I don't know what comes over me. Notice I said he said quite accurately. Like he, he, he doesn't know what comes over him. Now, often that's the case anyway. The wife loved her husband and, and loved him deeply and saw the many good sides of this flawed man. But she, of course, lived in fear that the next time he lost his temper and flew into a rage, he might bring harm that would not heal. So she stayed with her husband because each time he 
sincerely begged for forgiveness. And she, after all, knew as a Christian that it was her duty to forgive and extend grace. But the only thing that she knew about God's grace was forgiveness. And God's grace goes beyond that. She'd been told all her life that she was powerless over sin and that God's grace came to forgive her and restore her relationship with God. But she was enough of a Christian to understand that after all, if God had forgiven her and extended grace to her, that she should extend the same grace to others, especially her husband. So she knew a little bit about grace. She knew that forgiveness was an element of grace and it was a part of grace. But because she didn't understand all of grace, and her husband certainly didn't understand all of grace, that she was in a cycle of outburst, uh, rage, violence, um, uh, confusion, um, and then begging for forgiveness and, and forgiveness being extended. Well, this morning, as we've already said, grace is much more it's much bigger. It's a greater thing than just forgiveness. It's, it's uh, a part of forgiveness. And I, I know I'm certainly glad, I know you are too, for God's uh, forgiveness that restores and brings healing. But the story that, that I just shared, uh, forgiveness was a part of it. Grace was a part of it. But also that grace um, well, also involved in the story was not only grace and forgiveness, but a cycle of torment unless something was going to happen. The wife in our story was risking injury and death by staying in that relationship and staying in that home. And uh, the notion of grace expressed in constant forgiveness made her repeatedly uh, exposed and susceptible to violent outbursts. We look at the husband in the story uh, and we, we recognize that Jesus loves him too. God loves him. And I mentioned earlier that he may sincerely not understand what happened. He committed to himself. He told himself, I'm not going to do that again. I'm, those days are over. I'm going to keep control of myself and, and not lose my temper like I have in the past. But it continues. That cycle just seems to continue over and over and over again. And he's precious to the Lord too. Jesus died for him too. And so if we're sympathetic or take a sympathetic view of him, he is a tormented soul who can't seem to come to grips and come to understand and overcome the problems that he's dealing with. What about, what about Jesus? Is he the kind of savior that would save and say, go and sin no more and then give no power to sin no more? Is he the kind of savior that, that forgives and brings healing only to have a cycle repeated over and over and over and over again. In other words, do you think the Lord is interested in something changing in that relationship? Or is the Lord only interested in the nice Christian wife just for repeatedly forgiving the husband? That's what we want to talk about this morning, that grace is the answer that is needed in not only their marriage, but so many uh, other marriages and, uh, and our relationships and our lives. Beyond the characters in this story, what about, what about you and I? What about us? God saved us by his grace, but then does he just leave us to kind of suffer through, to muddle through, to, to live in a cycle of maybe a victory after a defeat? Maybe not a victory uh, followed by a defeat, but maybe a forgiveness and a restoration followed by uh, a defeat, followed by more forgiveness and, and maybe a restoration, but then more defeat. Or do you think maybe that God has in his plan that grace should be not only something that saves us, that Jesus went to the cross not only to, to save us from our sin and deliver us from God's judgment of our sin, in other words... Uh, we become Christians, and, and heaven is our home. But how many of you think that maybe God's grace extends to this life as well? And that God's grace is the answer that we need to, to free us from a cycle and the struggle of combating and very often losing with our struggle 
to sin. That was rhetorical. You don't have to answer, all right? But I think you get the idea that, that God has more to say on the subject than just now that you're a Christian, just kind of suffer through, and eventually you'll die and everything will be okay. Right? That's often, that's often what we think, right? Like, I'm a Christian. Now I go to heaven, so we're just, uh, you know, we're just waiting out the clock. Just waiting out the clock because the good stuff happens when I die. Well, God's grace is bigger and more powerful than that. God's grace doesn't just leave us in our old lifestyle and those old patterns and this old way of life. And one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is not only to be aware that the grace of God is bigger and greater than many of us uh, have imagined that it is, uh, but that we should be on the lookout for it, that we should be aware of it, that we should be attentive to, God, to God's grace moving in our lives. Uh, I shared a story that's disturbing, not the way I typically like to start a message. I love that there's visitors in the place. Does he start off every sermon with a depressing uh, uh, wife abusing story? Because I'm not sure. That's usually not, that's usually not the way it goes. I met some visitors this morning and thought, oh, I need a happy story. Let's come up with a happy story. We'll do, a, we'll do like normal, a happy story. Um, so that story's a little unsettling, a little uh, disturbing, but, but, it's a, but it's a true story. And it's a true story not only for those people that aren't Christians. This is very often a true story even in Christian families. So God's grace doesn't only mean forgiveness. There's something more to what Jesus did with our sin. Um, and that we can uh, find some measure of victory in this life. Wouldn't that be amazing? So God doesn't just leave us alone in our patterns, in our addictions, in our rage, in our anger, in our isolation, in our pain, in our hurt. God has a remedy for that, and it is God's grace. The problem, of course, is not with God, he's figured this all out. He sorted it out. He knows what he's doing. The problem is not with his grace, but the problem may be in our understanding of God's grace. Grace is an ongoing work, uh, God's work in our lives. Um, thankfully, the Lord does not just leave us to ourselves. Uh, one author wrote this, that grace forgives, but it also guides. It leads us. It, it, it helps us in this life. Set aside the question of heaven or hell, the author writes, after we die, what about heaven or hell while we live? His grace is available to lead and guide us right now. Anybody believe that this morning? The fabric of everyday life is alive and alive with the grace of God. If we wait until we've sinned to call upon the grace of God, we've squandered the greater part of grace. I think that's an interesting quote. Grace restores, but it also guards. It also instructs us and leads us and gives us guidance. It teaches us how to live our lives, to live a higher, uh, more sensible, a more godly, upright life. Uh, we need the grace of God. In other words, the grace of God isn't something that, you know, years ago I gave my heart and life to Christ, and uh, I'm sure glad for the grace of God that happened all those many years ago. Well, I need the grace of God this morning. Yeah. I need the grace of God today, and, and so do you. So the Bible teaches us that we're saved by grace, but the good news, and, and we can experience salvation, but the good news is that grace doesn't just leave us there. It doesn't just leave us um, caught in a cycle of, of defeat. Um, so what is grace? Well, we'll, we'll talk about later, uh, we'll talk about in the uh, later in the series, we'll talk about the New Testament word, but I found some Old Testament words that translate into grace, and uh, they are pretty exciting. Um, grace can be described and has been described as unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. So what's favor? Somebody just digs you, right? Can I say, is that, why do I say dig? I don't know. I'm not that old. Um, I was born in the 60s, but I wasn't really conscious then. Um, is that like a 60s thing? Hey, dig it. Dig it, baby. Um, but but uh, if somebody really likes you, someone extends uh, uh, favor, someone ha extends favors to you or has favor upon you. Favors is kind of a hard word for you to describe if you haven't written it down. Um, it's when someone takes a liking to you, maybe for no reason. So there is, I suppose, merited favor. Like, I like this person because... 
But grace is often described as unmerited favor. It's someone just gets a kick out of you, and there's really no reason why. Um, so there's three Hebrew words I discovered. There are three Hebrew words that express this idea of grace in the Old Testament. Um, the first one is, I believe this is pronounced uh, hen, H-E-N, with a line over it. I don't, I don't know what the line means. Uh, hen often designates the favor, um, the favor that the strong bestow on the weak. That this Hebrew word often designates the favor that the strong bestow on the weak. Um, especially by kings, uh, especially by kings and, uh, oh, sorry, um, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm on the next definition. All right, let me read that again because I butchered that. All right, hen often designates the, uh, designates the favor, sorry, the favor the strong bestow on the weak, especially by kings. Hang on. I have to put this on airplane mode because you are texting me during my sermon. Um, okay, you're not. I'm just getting messages. That's what's distracting me here. All right, so you got hen, hen, H-E-N. All right, so, but it, it, it's the favor that the strong bestow on the weak, often a king. So someone has authority and power and says, ah, I get a kick out of this little fella. Uh, I'm just going to be good. I'm just going to be good to him. So that's hen. It's related to our second uh, Hebrew word this morning, which is often uh, henan, which is often translated be gracious and designates, I like this, the action, the action of unmerited favor towards another in the context of need. Oh, that's pretty good. Hinan uh, means it designates the action of unmerited favor toward another in the context of need. Somebody's in need. And somebody who has the power takes action to do something about it. This definition goes on to say um, that it presupposes love or the assumption that there is love involved is present, but it cannot be, uh, this grace cannot be presumed. And so it happens uh, maybe variously and randomly, and, and we can't, uh, we can't, uh, be certain that it's going to take place. I'm not talking about God's grace. I'm talking about the way this word is used, the Hebrew word for it, and the way that it's sometimes used in the scriptures. Um, but it presupposes love. In other words, it's, it's grace just being dispensed at different times in different ways. And um, there's, there's, there's no way really to predict how that, how that grace is going to manifest itself, right? So if you're still with me this morning, how many of you know that if we call... Uh, out to the Lord for salvation, that his grace will find us there, and, and the Lord saves all who call upon the name of the Lord. You with me? You with me on that? But in my daily life, uh, and in your daily life, we don't always experience and walk in, in God just dropping grace on us from time to time, right? So it's, it's, he's, dispensing the, he's dispensing his grace for reasons that only he understands. He's the superior, we're, we're in need, and he dispenses it to us. Um, I shared, I think it was a few weeks ago, uh, I should say this is somebody else's story, but uh, I don't know about you, but I've had times where I've been a remarkable Christian. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was my sister said amen really loud. She knows, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been such a Christian that you surprised yourself? Like, what, what just happened? That was, that was incredible, right? Then you get into pride, and that's a different issue. We talked about that. Um, but I, I know I can think of a few times where something happened, and all of a sudden, like, it's, it's just like uh, this divine enablement or a gift from above or the ability, a divine ability just drops on you, and it's like God said, you're just, you're, this is your time. You're going to be super Christian right here, right? And I can think of a few occasions. You say, please tell us those occasions where you were surprised that how much of a Christian you actually acted like. That's my business. I'll just keep those uh, to myself. However, there have been times where uh, just 
something and it wasn't Chris Petty. Come on, somebody, right? It wasn't me. Like, you knew, like, that was a God thing. Like, there was somebody that was difficult to love and something just dropped on you and you were in love with them. Or somebody really, really did you wrong. I mean, maybe it was somebody that you trusted. And maybe it was something that, somebody that you were depending on and, and somebody that you leaned on. We, we, we fool ourselves after time into thinking that we can totally 100% trust another human being. How many of you have ever been, uh, uh, realized that that's not usually the case? And that maybe this person really lets you down in a major, major way. And somehow, easily and quickly, you were able to just forgive them. Maybe something that, that should have uh, threw you into a fit of rage didn't. Maybe someone that did something horrible to you rather than getting upset about it and, and speaking out about it or maybe even taking some action, you saw what was in them, you saw the weakness in them. And you, you saw, uh, you recognized, you remembered that hurt people, hurt people, thank you for finishing that for me, uh, and, and you were able to, rather than be angry with, you were able to see and have mercy and compassion on that individual instead. You're not nodding or amening like this has ever happened to you, so I'm glad I'm in the pulpit <laughs> and not you. No, I'm just, that's just a horrible, 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 horrible joke. Um, how many of you know there's also times where Chris just acts like Chris? Amen. That happens too. That happens too. But there have been times where I just I felt a, the grace, a divine enablement, the power of God just drop on me, and I was able to, like, I surprised myself that I responded the way I did. We need grace in our lives. All right, so this is, this is the, our, our second word is, um, uh, 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 all right, where am I at? Okay, I'm getting my words, I'm getting my words all turned around here. All right, um, so we're at... Hesed. Okay, so we did H E N, we did Hassan, and that was uh, the act, an action of unmerited favor towards another in the context of need. It presupposes love. All right, so then our last Hebrew word for, uh, that, that is translated grace uh, is also so sometimes translated as steadfast love. It's pretty, it's pretty good already, right? This is Hesed. Um, often translated as steadfast love, but also as the idea of grace. And the definition here is God not only grants periodic favor, that's, what I, that's the word I wanted, periodic favor. Like they need something, they need a little extra, they need a boost, they need some, they need this, they need that as they walk through their lives from day to day, from time to time. Periodic favor, periodic grace, a divine enablement here, a divine enablement there. But our third word here, Hasid, God not only grants periodic favor, but continues in a gracious relationship with his people. Between people, Hasid denotes a committed loyalty. A committed loyalty created by acts of kindness. Or by covenant. If you're a believer, you're in covenant with Almighty God. It denotes a committed loyalty created by acts of kindness. Why are you so faithful? Why are you so loyal to God? Because he has been so good to me. Why are you so committed? Because he is, he's been great to me. He, he has repeatedly blessed me and continues uh, to bless me throughout my life. Um, he... Uh, it's a loyalty created by his acts of kindness or by the covenant. This definition goes on to say that God's hesed or grace, however, flows from his love, not from an obligation. Isn't that amazing? This author went on to, go, went on to say that grace fills the Psalms, which confess that God's hesed or God's grace endures forever often paired with faithfulness. This is the grace of salvation experienced in history, which continues despite Israel's sins or our sins and gives hope. It gives confidence in times of need, even in the face of death. 
Grace accompanies and crowns a believer's life. Grace as a divine enablement or God's favor resting upon our lives. If you're a born-again Christian in this place this morning, I'm thrilled that heaven, it will be your eternal home. But we need grace in our lives as well, right? Um, grace is something that, that, that we need. It teaches us. It, it guides us. It leads us. All right. So let's take a look at our text today. Uh, Titus. We're going to look at Titus um, chapter 2. And uh, we're going to look at we're going to look at how grace is used here in Titus a few different ways here in this one verse. Some that are familiar, and some that are unfamiliar. So Paul's writing to young pastor Titus under the inspiration of God's Spirit, and uh, Titus traveled with Paul, and Titus was uh, had been trained by Paul. It's interesting that Paul spoke of Titus with great affection. He said of him, he called him, "quote my true child." in the faith. So they were, they were close, and Paul had great affection for Titus. So let's take a look at Titus 2, uh, beginning in verse 11. For the, what's that word? Let's just shout that out together. For the grace. grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men. So, so there it is, salvation, all right? But he goes on, verse 12. It teaches us what does? Grace does. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. <clears throat> Verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. A couple things on verse 13. This isn't in my notes. This is when you should be nervous. Um, don't worry. When I go off the notes, that's when I should get nervous too. Uh, that's, when the, that's when the worst things happen. Uh, but verse 13, check this out. While we wait for the blessed hope. What's the blessed hope, everybody? We sometimes call that the rapture. That's what that's referring to, the rapture, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're waiting for the rapture. We're, we're waiting for the return of Christ. So verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope or the rapture of the church, and then look, this is kind of cool. We, we, we can't touch on this verse without mentioning this, that the deity of Jesus Christ is mentioned in this scripture. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Commas are important. That's the way that should be read. Not while we wait for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not, what, that, it's not what that says. Uh, verse 13 says that we await our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So um, if you've got your Bibles, hey, people do have Bibles. That's like Bibles with pages. What in the world? Um, if you want to underline that, remember that's, that's uh, a scripture that speaks to the deity of Christ. It's our great God and Savior, Jesus. So Jesus is our Savior and he's our God. All right. Um, Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So Titus 2 um, uses the word grace. Can we just go back to verse 11? And then we'll just kind of uh, maybe just take a quick look at this again, um, verses 11 and 12 anyway. Uh, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So we're talking about grace. So salvation, that's what we're used to hearing. Thank God for saving grace. But if we look at verse 12, it teaches us to say, what does? Grace does. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. We could read it this way. And it teaches us, grace does, and grace teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So there's a lot of things that grace is doing for us in our lives. That one, self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. So there's saving grace, but the Bible also in verse 12 says that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. So we'll go back to our story about the husband. In our story, I don't know if this husband is a believer or not. We know that the, we know that the wife is a believer. Um, but this husband is trapped in a cycle that he loses his, loses his temper, loses his mind, and acts out inappropriately and seems to be doomed 
to this cycle that repeats over and over again. And the good Christian wife, knowing a little about grace, I should extend grace because God extended grace to me, so I will just extend grace continuously. Uh, but there's a disconnect because grace should bring about a change in that relationship. And Paul writes to Titus here, and he says that grace also teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. That we live a higher life, a better life, a more godly life because of the grace of God that, that he has equipped us with. Amen? Amen? The grace of God is what causes us to change and become more Christ-like. Isn't that good news? That change is possible. That the Lord doesn't just save us from our sin. And then like we saw in, we see in the Gospels where Jesus would, would heal or deliver someone and say, go and sin no more. I won't ask for a show of hands. But I know at least a few of us, a few of you had to be like me and, and have read that and went, yeah, well, how do you pull that off? How do you do that, right? How, how do you go and sin no more? Well, I'm still working on it, right? I'm a work in progress. I, I haven't arrived yet. But the grace of God will help you break free from addictions and sinful patterns and destructive patterns and, and hurtful patterns, right? The grace of God will help you with that. We need his grace today in our lives. I need it today. Um, but it, it's not just uh, the negative of the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness or say no to sin, but it also, the scripture tells us, teaches us how to live a godly life. What does is, uh, what is, uh, Paul say? To live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I'm not sure it's getting easier in this present age to do those things, but the grace of God will help you do that. The grace of God will help you to not uh, have outbursts of great anger, right? Um, and rage. We have to be careful about anger. Somebody's thinking it. Is all anger sin? It's not. The Bible says to be angry and sin not. Being angry is one thing. Fits of rage and, and, and using intimidation and fear um, and, and, and outbursts. How many of you know that will get you into trouble? Right? That can, get, that can get you into trouble right quick. So it's not just the negatives, but, but in a positive, the grace of God teaches us how to live a godly life, self-controlled, an upright life. Um, you might be like me and surprise yourself with, wow, I've responded weirdly. Like, I'm not only pretending to keep my cool, like, cause that, and that's admirable. Come on, somebody, right? It's admirable to pretend to keep your cool, just like you're a raging turmoil on the inside, but you just don't manifest it. Um, you know, hats off to you. But, and that's okay, you're doing, gr you're doing great. <laughs> But I've startled myself with, yeah, I'm not even pretending to not get mad. Like, I'm actually not upset by that. Weird. <laughs> what a life, right? Uh, but the grace of God will do that for you. And then Paul goes on and talks about um, the blessed hope. And this, this author says that, you know what? The grace of God fills us with hope. And knowing that the Lord hasn't just saved us and left us here um, with a pattern of, oh, I messed up again. God, will you forgive me? Will so-and-so, will you forgive me? Will, you know, and I'm just in this cycle of repeated, well, it's a good thing I got the grace of God because I, I need to ask for forgiveness every single day of my life. How about the grace of God sets us free, breaks us loose, uh, and delivers us from those old ways of living and those patterns of life? That should give you hope. Yes. That's good news this morning. Like, gospel means good news, and the grace of God is good news, but it extends beyond just salvation. So that's the point we want to make this morning, is that when we think God's grace, we often, our mind automatically goes to forgiveness or maybe salvation. And if nothing else, after today, I hope that when we hear the term or we read the grace of God, that we understand that it is so much greater, so much broader and wider and deeper and more complex than we may have ever, ever realized. So the grace of God will be our teacher, uh, will instruct us, will lead us, will guide us. Um, someone said it this way, and I think, well, we, a lot of people have said, 
and, and made note that when God asks you to do something, he empowers you to get the job done. How many of you believe that this morning? If God asks you to uh, do a certain thing, he will enable you, he will equip you, he will give you the divine power to accomplish that thing. And we know God wants us to live upright lives. We know that God wants us to live godly lives. We know that God wants us to live in a way where we do say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. We know that God wants that. And, and thankfully, he gives us a way to overcome and to change. What he asks us to do, he empowers us to do. Um, I'm so grateful that, that th this whole Christianity thing is not just something that takes care of, of what happens when I die. It's not just a matter of heaven or hell when I die, as noted earlier. What about the heaven and hell that we might experience here? Well, I submit to you this morning, friends, that the grace of God truly brings a little of heaven right to where we live in, in our life right now. God makes a difference in our lives right now. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we're so grateful this morning for the grace of God. Lord, we, Lord I, I pray this morning that if there's one in this place or maybe one listening online this morning that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, maybe, maybe they've been trusting in their own works. They've been trusting and, and hoping that their good will outweigh their bad. You know, when, when we take that approach, I hope my good outweighs my bad, it leaves us wondering we never have certainty. We never have confidence. And those seasoned believers within the sound of my voice this morning, they know what, they probably know what I'm gonna say next, but not only does it leave you with an uncertainty, hoping that your good outweighs your bad, scripturally, the Bible tells us that, that we don't attain eternal life that way. That God is so holy so perfect and so beyond and above us. That in our fallen sinful state, we have, we have nothing to offer him. Isaiah says that our righteous works or our righteousness or the good things that we do, that we think we're scoring points with God, those things are like filthy rags, like trash. That speaks to the holiness of Almighty God. And the good news this morning is that if you've never received God's grace and entered into a covenant relationship with Him, if you've never received God's forgiveness, Jesus provided the grace of God which brings salvation to, all, to everyone who calls upon him and places their trust and their confidence in Jesus. But the grace of God also is for believers. Lord, we need your grace in our lives. We sometimes might, we could be very generic about it and say, well, I'm going through and I'm struggling through this situation. Maybe we say, well, I just need God to answer my prayer, to give me an answer, to work a miracle for me. And I don't know what you might need this morning or what you might be in need of. But we could describe it this way. I think it, it suits most situations. What we, what we really need is the grace of God in our lives. The grace of God may be that answer to prayer. It may be that deliverance. It may be that, that cycle broken in someone's life. But if you don't get the answer that you want, and if God doesn't deliver the miracle that you're requesting, the grace of God will get you through either way. 
Lord, we need, we need grace to live in this, in this world. We need grace to interact with other human beings. You've designed us to need other human beings, but how long does it take to have some conflict with, <laughs> with another individual? We need your grace in our lives. Lord, husbands need your grace. Wives need your grace in their lives. Parents, you know what? We'll ask for a double portion for parents this morning, right? Could parents use some more of God's grace and extend God's grace? Lord, we're grateful this morning that you haven't just left us here helpless and feeling guilty. I don't know that it's, that it's the unbeliever that feels guilty for the wrong that they do. They may not be even be aware of it. But boy, we Christians, we can sure beat ourselves up because we recognize what's pleasing to the Lord and, and, how it, and, and, and we recognize those things that harm us and, and hurt our relationships. Maybe it's the Christian that feels the most guilt. My Bible tells me that where sin abounds, grace abounds all that much more. However dire, however dark, however desperate that situation is that you're going through, God can supply you with more grace. Lord, we're in need of that this morning. I pray that you would give us a revelation this morning, a fuller, a fuller and a better and a more complete picture of what God's grace really is. Lord God, make us sensitive to recognize and to identify even moments in our lives where we can see, you know what, that was, that was God working supernaturally in my life. We sometimes think of maybe the grace of God or the hand of God doing things like parting the Red Sea or raising the dead to life, or breaking patterns and cycles of addiction and behavior and ungodliness. That is nothing short of a miracle and the grace of God. Lord, may we look at your grace from now and forevermore as not just something that saves us, but something that we're in desperate need of every day of our lives. That it changes us, leads us, guides us. It instructs us and keeps us out of trouble. It, it, and it can surprise us as well. Lord, we're so grateful that you didn't just leave us here with a consciousness of our sin and a desire to live a different kind of lifestyle. And we have no ability to make any change whatsoever. Lord God, move us from glory to glory and uh, change us into your image. Lord, we ask that this morning, we're grateful for your grace. We're thankful we celebrate your grace this morning. The awesome